Hi, I'm David Rothkopf, the CEO of the DSR Network and host of the Deep State Radio podcast. Here at DSR, we have always believed that in a world as complex, fast-moving, and full of risks as ours, we all need access to the best minds. That is why we have created the leading network for expert podcasts on the issues of the day you care about. We go in-depth on politics, the law, national security, foreign policy, intelligence, defense, climate, and new technologies with regular and special guests that are the leading voices in their fields. We also offer daily updates on global news, our DSR Daily, and on a key story of the day through our partnership with the New Republic. That is why over a million times a month, people like you choose to spend time with our hosts and guests. Membership is what supports this, and members get special benefits, including bonus content in virtually all of our podcasts. It's a big deal, and it's a good deal. Our monthly membership price is going to go up for the first time in our history on March 1st. So now is the time you can lock in our founder's rate of just $5 a month. To do so, go to the dsrnetwork.com and click on membership. It's that easy, but don't delay. Today's rates will only be available for a few more weeks. Join us. Support us. Go to the dsrnetwork.com right now. Thank you. Hi, this is Riley Fessler. Today's episode from the silo is an episode of Words Matter from July 2022, in which Norm and Kavita discuss the Bill of Rights and the continued fight for freedom. Please enjoy. This is Words Matter with Norm Ornstein. We've got the votes and screw the rest of you. And Dr. Kavita Patel. These might be some of the smaller moments, you know, with all the bombshells, didn't catch people's eyes. Hello, welcome to Words Matter from the DSR Network. Each week, Kavita and I will talk about the issues facing our country as we head into the midterms and what our leaders are saying and doing about them. We use the word leaders somewhat loosely. We hope you like the show. We'd love to hear your feedback as we continue to shape it moving forward. If you have any comments, feel free to send us an email at podcasts at the dsrnetwork.com. Now, on with the show. Today, it's the July 4th week, after all. We're going to take a look at the Constitution and how the Constitution itself, including especially, but not exclusively, the Bill of Rights, is playing out around the country and with our leaders, again, using the term uh, somewhat loosely. So here's a clip of our producer, Grant Haver, reading the text of the first two amendments of the Bill of Rights. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, We have the first two amendments. First Amendment, of course, very famous. But there are two parts of this amendment, Kavita, that I thought are worth talking about in the context of what the Supreme Court has done. And that, of course, is those core elements, the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. Just a a couple of observations on the freedom of speech part of it. We've had some interesting rulings in the past from the Supreme Court on freedom of speech. One uh, that I thought was particularly pointed was Madsen versus Women's Health Center, which was in 1994, which was about a zone of protection around abortion clinic workers' homes in which the court decided that they were fair game and there's a lot of 
historical reason for protests outside the homes of uh, individuals if uh, the protesters feel that there's something wrong about it. And then, of course, the court took that one step further in 2014, which was uh, about the zone of protection around abortion clinics themselves. Massachusetts had had a zone because of uh, the threats and occasional violence that accompanied people going into abortion clinics. And the court said basically that, hey, that's a part of free speech. And uh, Justice Scalia in particular had a statement in his ruling on this. Uh, It was, I should note, unanimous in some fashion, but there were a lot of different variations. And Scalia, joined by Thomas, said, quote, protecting people from speech they do not want to hear is not a function that the First Amendment allows the government to undertake in the public streets and sidewalks. Now, I mention both of these because somehow the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, has taken a very different view when it comes to protests involving their actions. We have now around the Supreme Court what looks like protection from an attack. Huge fences set up, creating a huge amount of space before people actually get to the building of the court itself, even though the protests that were there in the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision on uh, Roe v. Wade were peaceful. And at the same time, we have the head of security of the Supreme Court notifying officials in Maryland especially that they had better crack down on any protests, no matter how peaceful, near the homes of Supreme Court justices. And several of them, including Justice Kavanaugh, of course, reside in Maryland. So uh, here we have a part of the First Amendment that the court has been zealous about protecting, especially when it comes to anti-abortion protesters, but taking a very different view about their own actions. Yeah, Norm, it's uh, it's funny. I I wanted to try to thinking about uh, the reading of the First Amendment and just kind of just trying to summarize it as best as you can. You know, protecting religion, speech, assembly. Kind of to your point, petition. There is so many overlaps, not just with Dobbs and uh, reproductive justice. It's also been very relevant in the kind of COVID nineteen because there's so many kind of pandemic era post-pandemic era lawsuits. The one that obviously the Supreme Court gave a lot of attention to was around the vaccine mandate. But I will just offer, there have been several examples where there were kind of hypotheticals, real cases that kind of got settled in like either the district courts or in lower courts and did not make it to the Supreme Court, but that there were kind of potentials for this to go to the Supreme Court. And it had everything to do with things such as the shelter in place order. As you remember, that actually started in the Trump administration and whether or not the state interest for New Mexico, for example, in this case, governor that actually put into place a shelter in place order when the federal government had lifted the stay at home orders was compelling enough to override First Amendment guarantees. And it's been very interesting to me. There was a point when Lujan and, and when she brought the governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, a Democrat of New, of New Mexico, governor that at, the, at the time and currently filed a suit in federal court defending her stay at home order, there was a very interesting kind of back and forth legally about whether or not the First Amendment, whether or not the kind of public health kind of obligation to people, especially the CDC, as well as any state's authority, really had the best interest to override that First Amendment guarantee. And it's been a similar argument that I know a number of reproductive justice advocates, myself included, have been trying to kind of make a point around some of the um, abortion laws. And, and it's very, the, the part that I think has been really interesting for me to watch during COVID has been that at the same time, if you'll remember, Norm, there were incredible debates about whether churches and houses of worship could be open during those stay at home orders, even when the federal government, when the Trump administration had put those into place. So I, I find that what might have been like kind of in, you know, in the room where it happened, kind of the thoughts of, our constitutional authors and kind of the framers, obviously, they they had not taken into consideration abortion pandemics, you know, what would happen during stay at home orders. And I do think that 
when the cases came forward for some of the mega churches that also brought lawsuits kind of against the shelter in place orders and that they had caused to be able to allow people to gather, by the way, which most of the courts said, yes, houses of worship should have the right to offer services and be able to bring people together, but they had to do it really under kind of public health guidance. So that's why you saw some of these mega churches having to put into literally they wouldn't close their doors and they had thousands of people, but the mega churches had to kind of in theory offer like quote social distancing and some of these other things that I, I did not think were possible. And in fact, at the time, one in 10 mega churches, particularly in the South and what we call the Bible Belt, the South, Southern, Southeastern United States actually had their doors open throughout the pandemic. So, which clearly put individuals' public health at risk. And so I, I feel like there's, to your point, Norm, that there's not just at the Supreme Court level, but there is, I can't help but feel like there's the will to use the First Amendment in your case as it best serves your purposes. And that truly, I, this is me speaking as a non-lawyer, that truly you can make an argument out of anything. So you can say that like we have the freedom of religion, totally reasonable, prayer at the 50-yard line, even if everyone else around you does not want to do it. All of these things, stay-at-home orders, reproductive rights, depending on kind of your perspective. And what worries me about this for our democracy is that so much of that is now politically aligned. So it's not just, well, you know, I'm, I'm religious and I want to find a way to express my religious freedom. That sentiment is completely valid, completely reasonable, and should be the basis of some of these arguments, which they are. But I can't help but think these are norm. You can go down and up the line. I was trying to draw up some of the cases. You were talking about Madsen. There's a tobacco case that was famous in uh, the early part of the century, uh, Laurelard Tobacco v. Massachusetts. And it was about the ability for tobacco companies, kind of before there was a real crackdown on how tobacco companies advertise to the public. The state of Massachusetts being, you know, kind of one of the more advanced progressive states had brought, basically put out incredibly strict state-based regulations. Again, remember before the feds did about what tobacco companies could say and not say about their products. In particular, one tobacco company, not Philip Morris, not the big one at the time, but one that had a more regional presence, they sued. And, and, and this was on the basis of freedom of speech. Sorrell versus IMS Health. I mean, there's a number of cases that exactly parallel kind of your point. And I don't think the public realizes it. And I think that it's important now for listeners to actually consider these things because they are the building blocks for why, again, I worry about the democracy. I'll just point out one more famous case. I had to look it up because I couldn't remember the plaintiff's name. It was also Massachusetts. It's Jacobson v. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in which the federal court upheld a compulsory state vaccine law for smallpox as a legitimate exercise of state police powers. And it was how ironic, like, could you imagine, Norm, that happening in 2022 in any court? Probably not. But it was notwithstanding the claim that the law kind of interfered with personal liberties, something that we've heard often. But I think that this just to me, like on reflection, feels like, Norm, we've got more and more on the line. And whether you and I, like I was raised thinking the judicial branch, this is sacred. This is, and I don't mean that in a religious way. It's something that I studied and I held this like checks and balances of power seriously. I no longer feel that faith. And I and I kind of now accumulating this evidence to your point, we'll get into Second Amendment, we'll get into the next section. But I do think it's a very, I think this is a time when, when readers, listeners, viewers uh, of our podcast need to pay attention to the words. And, and we also need to think about the precedent because you and I can cite a number of cases now where the best interest for the public was upheld and the best interest for what the First Amendment we thought represented was upheld, and, and it's not the case anymore. You know, you've made a really important point that people rarely do in pulling things together. A million people or more died from COVID. The court, this Supreme Court, tied the hands of the CDC in trying to protect people from serious injury or what was a deadly virus and death, and basically put the First Amendment over lives. All of a sudden now with abortion, it's pro-life. And it shows to me a level of hypocrisy or a lack of adherence to 
fundamental principles that now defines this court. Now, before we get away from the First Amendment, and you talked a little bit about religion, but I, there are a couple of things that really need to be said there. The one which just came up and I noticed, which is a far right religious group that prayed with some Supreme Court justices. And then the those justices ruled in favor of a case brought by this religious group. It is hard for me to imagine a more blatant conflict of interest than what we saw there. And of course, it raises another question, which is that while there is a judicial code of ethics that applies to federal judges, it does not apply to the Supreme Court. We've had this controversy over Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny, that continues. I'm uh, hoping that the January 6th committee will dig more deeply into Ginny Thomas's actions to promote a violent insurrection. She's now refused after saying, of course, she'd be happy to talk to the January 6th committee, backed off from that. But it's a reflection of where we are with the First Amendment on religion. And it's basically blowing up 200 years of practice and what the framers clearly wanted. Framers didn't want to outlaw religion. They did not want to link the government to religion. They didn't want the government to promote religion generally because that would almost inevitably lead to promotion of a particular religion. They wanted religious practices to be protected, but separate from the government. Now we've had two cases in this term. One, of course, where in Maine, where there are some districts where there aren't schools, and Maine had passed a law saying that students could be subsidized going to schools in other districts where they existed. The court saying that taxpayers had to pay for religious schools, which is linking taxpayers directly to religion. And then, of course, we had this ruling that you mentioned on the football coach at the 50 yard line, surrounded by players. And where, as the dissent in the case noted, players who would not gather with and kneel with the coach at the 50 yard line knew pretty well that they were not likely to get much playing time. So it was, in effect, coercing religious expression by a public school. And the court basically ran roughshod over what we've known as the First Amendment in this regard. Now, you know, a lot of people have said, and I think it's accurate, if you got a madrasa set up in Maine saying you want taxpayer dollars, Mm -hmm. I doubt very much that that's going to work because this is... I know teachers, I, I, I have relatives and friends who are Muslim who are teachers at different levels of education, including universities. And, and you know, part of their regular religious practice is, is prayers during the day. And they have said, even in public universities, they have said, like, there's accommodations for places for them to pray. But people make it very clear that they are not supposed to kind of pray in an area where others feel pressured to observe their prayers. And, and it's very interesting, that choice, because there are churches, there are in hospitals, I'm sure you've been, I mean, in many hospitals, there are now kind of either, either religious agnostic or just kind of special areas where people can pray and have some quiet and solace. But it is very clear, you're right, not even a madrasa. I think even somebody who is just trying to practice their individual religion, especially if they're Muslim and they bring a prayer mat out and they need to have it kind of in a certain direction. So they do need to put it in a certain place, wherever it may be they're not necessarily welcome on any of these grounds. And I think this is exactly why I, I uh, will we'll move on to the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in a moment. But I think I can't help but think that this is just an unfortunate, all it's done is kind of put a cut, you know, it's taken a cudgel to what I do think is an appropriate part of the framers um, logic, which was that there should be this freedom of expression, be it religion or speech. But now that has been taken and it's been wielded as left versus right. And what is what is right? Right, so to speak. Right is fundamental Christian and generally speaking, you know, white. And and that's that's what I think we're not saying. What people want to say is people people want to say, First um, Amendment only protects you if you happen to have these beliefs. If you don't, those First Amendment rights go away. And that's exactly what what's not being spoken about. It's not it's what candidates will not say on a podium, but that's what it feels like. 
of course, we'll get back to this, and we discussed it before, but it becomes so important now. The Supreme Court is an institution that we have relied on to fairly judge what are difficult questions, often a lot of nuances here, over what the Constitution is supposed to mean. We have a number of judges who say that they're strict constructionists, that they go by the words of the Constitution and the historical meaning. But what we've seen with these cases is that if they find instances where their own political beliefs would not fit with that, they throw the Constitution and the historical experience aside, or they do a very distorted view. And that's a crisis that we face right now. We have a crisis with democracy. And that, of course, is a crisis that we face from uh, Trump and his acolytes and the violent insurrection, the attempts to suppress votes and more. But more generally, we have a crisis if you have a Supreme Court that's gone rogue. Now, going rogue again, we can also talk about the Second Amendment. And of course, the nation shocked again on July 4th by what happened in Highland Park, uh, Illinois. And we know here again, we've had court rulings. We had the Heller case, a very famous case, in which the court basically wrote out of the Second Amendment what has in the past been considered the critical element. And what we know from historical experience was the critical element, namely a well-regulated militia. It's the only amendment where you actually have such an uh, introductory clause. But at least in the Heller case, Justice Scalia, who wrote it, and I think, you know, dishonestly interpreted what the Second Amendment is supposed to mean, said this doesn't preclude regulations of the types of weapons of who can have those weapons. And in the most recent case, basically, they're taking away those constraints. Now it's almost anything goes. And while Congress responded pretty weakly with a law that actually had more to do with reforming some of the mental health policies than it did with guns themselves, we can see that it's open season. And we've had numerous violent attacks. You know, we've seen a couple of pictures of some of the bodies. These assault weapons don't just kill, they destroy. They are weapons of war, and they're all over the place. We know that in the past, when we banned assault weapons, the number of deadly shootings and mass shootings went down significantly. Once that ban was lifted, they went up. We are alone in the world, basically, in having this kind of reality that we face anywhere you go in the country. You have to worry about somebody grabbing an assault weapon and he had 30 bullet magazines. What 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 universe? And this is a very, I think what was interesting for me, Norm, about Highland Park, I'm, I'm sure you visited and, you know, affluent suburb. This is Americana, right? Like Highland Park is like the July 4th parade in America, you know, Highland Park, like nothing could be more apple pie, bread and butter, Americana, and kind of what, when I was growing up as like a, you know, a little girl, like, oh, that's what, you know, that's what arriving in America meant to, to immigrant families and how that's just gotten torn apart as, as well as a plan to, you know, go into other States and potentially recreate such violence. And it's, it's stunning too, because the Heritage Foundation like reposted (laughs) the Heritage Foundation where I get so much of my information from, as you can imagine, but I, I, they reposted a study they had done, study loose loose terms here, quotes, air quotes, in, from 2020 that said that example, Highland Park, and they even cite other mass gun violence incidents that just happened in the last several days and several weeks, unfortunately. They basically said that that emphasizes the need for Americans to rely on the Second Amendment to protect their lives and livelihoods. And they, they even go so far as to say which I find fascinating. We'll put, I'll send this link for our producer to include. Fascinating. They, they actually cite a CDC report, 2013, CDC uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Almost every major study on the issue has found that Americans use their firearms in self-defense between 500,000 and 3 million times a year. There is a good reason to believe that most of these defensive gun uses are not reported to police, much less make the local or national news. So even in light of something that is, you know, the child, the two-year-old toddler that's orphaned because both of his parents were gunned down and untold stories of like mothers like shielding their children from gunfire. 
Even now, though, Norm, they're doubling down on actually see that incident is the reason why the Second Amendment is there. The Second Amendment, and again, I'm going to quote, not to not to actually like offer a platform to just amplify, but I think this is what this is the reality that not only is the Supreme Court, the Alito Court kind of literally ruling on, but basically it's the primary purpose, quote from Heritage, the primary purpose of the Second Amendment is not so that you can secure your dinner. And this is actually funny why they wrote that. It's so that you can secure your inalienable rights. Everyday untold Americans rely on their Second Amendment rights to protect their lives. Only a small portion of these stories make the news. And what they reference was not to secure your dinner. And I forgot this, Norm, I have to be honest, because, you know, COVID was happening in September 2020. This was in response to the launch of something called Sportsmen and Sportswomen for Biden, which I didn't, it actually was a thing. I got a blip in Colorado local news, or the state news and the state papers and the local papers there, because at the time, candidate Joe Biden had actually had like former figures, think Ken Salazar, I think prominent Coloradans who showed that there is a very robust role for guns, for sport, for hunting, for anglers. and and that it's there is a way to have law abiding Americans purchase and responsibly use firearms for hunting and sporting. And it's funny, you know, it's funny now on reflection, I'm like, that is so tone deaf. But I also realize, again, using these cudgels, the Second Amendment, Biden basically postulating that, you know, there's parts of your Second Amendment not meant for militias, not meant for what we've seen, but there is a valid use to guns. And, and this is something every Democrat has to deal with. Because if you look like you want to promote what Canada has done, what Justin Trudeau has done, you know, then then you shouldn't be in the United States. So even Biden, back as candidate Biden, kind of had to deal with that pressure, and that's yet still used against him. And so I know we can go. Let's let's shift to the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, where I know we're going to have a a, a good discussion because I feel like this is going to. Sadly, you and I are going to revisit the Second Amendment as well as the First Amendment, unfortunately, many times, probably in the time of our podcast. And it's it's just something the public probably, uh, I encourage people to look through history and understand why this moment is something not only uh, incredibly unique, but deeply disturbing and why I'm hoping candidates for some of the upcoming primaries, I really hope that we start seeing some very clear parts of their platforms with their statements on some of these issues in particular, on the amendments, on these rights that normally I wouldn't expect candidates to have to voice out upon. It's not just guns. It's not just abortion. It's literally the freedom of our right to assembly, the freedom of our press, the freedom of what we'll get to in the members exclusive about what the role of regulating misinformation is and what the role of the government is in this in this situation. While the First and Second Amendments, as well as some of the other amendments, get a lot of a focus, the conservatives on this court are focused on and have amplified the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And here they are for word for word, read by our producer. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Amendment 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So now here's what I'm going to tell you. I actually do this sometimes because I have to try to think like, how could I explain this to a child? How do I how do I explain this to somebody, especially the Tenth Amendment? And and here's uh, what I came up with for our podcast today. And the child, by the way, is me. But I've, I've tried to think through, like, why is the Tenth Amendment, or the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, but why are these amendments so important? So let's do the Ninth first to kind of my lay, like, here's what, what's on the line here. Basically, the federal government does not own the rights that are not listed in the Constitution. They belong to the people. Okay, fine. Let's talk, we'll talk about that in a second. And then here's me explaining the Tenth Amendment to my seven-year-old. The Tenth Amendment is, is basically the, the power of the right that's not specifically listed in the Constitution as belonging to the federal government belongs to states, individual states, or the American people. So basically, all these things that are not specifically enumerated default to the people or to the states. I do think that there has been this tension, we've referred to it in earlier episodes, This came up with the Affordable Care Act. I mean, it's come up in a number of significant domestic policy issues. 
come up with the EPA. I mean, I can't think of a single kind of area, education, energy, healthcare, defense, every aspect actually touches on this notion of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which is, again, for, for listeners and viewers, this is something that I have not seen exhibited so much in a court. I went back several courts to try to understand where have conservative justices previously kind of invoked nine and 10. And we've seen it in places, but not to the degree that we've seen it now. And, and I do it, it'd be curious, Norm, kind of one, what does that signal? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because if we didn't have a composition in the country where I would say roughly half of the map is pretty conservative, again, going back to the ideology of much of the country, would they feel this way? If we only had a pocket, uh, if there was you know blue lighting up the map, would the court feel the same way? Probably not. The skeptic in me thinks no. So I'm curious kind of how you see the Alito court in light of nine and 10. What also could we expect to get dismantled? What's on the dockets or what could be on the dockets? I've, we've, we've taken apart all these other sectors, done. What's left that could then be subject to kind of dismantling because of an interpretation of nine and 10? First, let me say that the Ninth Amendment especially to me is very important because it's basically saying, hey, we're not enumerating absolutely everything. There are other rights out there. And in a lot of ways, uh, the decisions involving contraception, abortion, same-sex relations and marriage, sodomy, were based on the Ninth Amendment. It was saying there are freedoms that were not specifically mentioned. And if the court did not say, uh, if the Constitution did not say anything about the right of people to marry who they wanted to marry, and that includes uh, loving with uh, interracial marriage, those rights are still there. I noticed in the uh, statement made by Justice Thomas in the uh, Dobbs case after Alito had said, now, of course, this is only about abortion. That's different from all the others. Justice Thomas said, oh, no, you've now opened up this can of worms, and we can go back and look at contraception and uh, sodomy and same-sex marriage. He did not mention interracial marriage in that one, interestingly, but we're seeing that there's a very selective use of what the Ninth uh, Amendment means. And the Tenth Amendment is one that conservatives, you know, there are a couple of statements that you always see from people over on the, uh, especially the radical right. One is we have a republic, not a democracy. The other is 10th Amendment, it's the states. The 10th Amendment, as you said, also says the states and the people. And when you talk about what's coming next, I'm worried especially about this independent state legislature's doctrine, which says the words of the Constitution are that state legislatures determine electors. And they may take this more broadly to say that only state legislatures and they've defined it only as the state legislature, can have complete sway over elections, federal and state, ignoring what role Congress can play. But what we know is that the state legislatures didn't just emerge from nowhere. Every state has a constitution which created the state legislature, even as it also created state courts and they have to operate within the context of those state constitutions, the Supreme Court may blow all that up. I'll make one more broad point here, which is strict constructionists who rely on the Constitution, that means relying on all the amendments. While they focus on these Ninth and Tenth Amendments, and this actually I should mention one other element here, which is you have a freedom to travel, but we know that the 14th Amendment is ignored by this court. The 14th Amendment, let me read a couple of uh, elements. Section one, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now we are seeing states that are trying to punish people who go to other states to fulfill their own rights. It is a blatant violation of the 14th Amendment, but I'm not at all sure that the court, when it has to hear these things, is going to abide by that. And of course, 
We also know that the 14th Amendment has an equal protection clause. There's an equal protection of the laws for people, which also gets back to this question of whether you can punish an individual who travels from one state to another. We know that this is a selective interpretation of the Constitution, just as we know that people love the 10th Amendment until a state, as Oregon did, for example, with an assisted suicide law, does what it wants to do. Then they say, oh, no, you can't do that. It's only what we want. That's where we are right now. You cannot rely on the Constitution when courts basically interpret it to fit their own judgments and their own political beliefs. And I think on top, it's uh, so I'll just share with listeners that uh, just to drive home uh, where the, the kind of the rubber is hitting the road. So there's a number of us, myself included, who have kind of volunteered to prescribe totally legal. We have either licenses in states or because of the public health emergency, actually, we have the flexibility to prescribe across states. And there are people, so there are advocates and people on the ground in Texas where we know that there is kind of pent up demand for some of the medication abortions and none of the clinics or, you know, obviously because of trigger laws, no providers that want to kind of advertise with a shingle. And we're, there is literally just a back and forth right now about, for example, even though I have all the legal authority to prescribe across state lines. We're telling women, and we're, we're literally trying to figure out how to crowdsource this so that every single woman doesn't have to do it. Should we, you know, try to, that we're recommending that they use mail order pharmacies and use some friend's address outside of Texas, but then have kind of an auto forwarding set up with the mail order pharmacy that then defaults, even though I prescribe it to Tulsa, you know, someplace in Potomac, Maryland, it'll then default and forward to someplace in Texas or calling in prescriptions into states that fall outside of these trigger law states so that they can have somebody go pick them up across these state lines, even though I absolutely have the right to prescribe it for a woman for that purpose, but it could subject me to being reported by somebody. We don't know who, but that's exactly, and it's it's this tension sitting squarely in nine and 10 to that point. And my question has been, so we talked about the 10th Amendment and how I'd explain it to a seven-year-old. So where is the right to that woman? So yes, the state law kind of enumerates against that woman being able to receive certain services after a certain amount of time, six weeks, et cetera. Where is that individual's rights then and what tension is that? And so how, how do we, and, and in fact, lawyers are trying to kind of think through how to use the 10th Amendment, to your point, as a way to counterweigh and it's why in Louisiana, maybe in a future episode, we can actually dissect a little bit of what's happening in the state of Louisiana, where there is an active back and forth in the courts around their abortion ban. And there's a very, like, very interesting kind of, there have been very interesting writs and other documents put together that have given exactly what we just described, that the individuals in these state, despite the state laws, have their rights too, and what what are those rights? And so I, I, I guess stay tuned because I'm I'm certain we will get into more of this. But it would be fascinating to see how lawyers kind of can use the way the Alito Court has used it to their advantage, be able to flip this. But I'm I, we're dealing with it right now. I'm trying to prescribe, and frankly, Norm, I'm kind of <laughs> I didn't realize you know I have malpractice insurance and everything, and one of the lawyers in Texas were kind of on this like underground network. She said to me, she said, have you looked at your malpractice clause as it relates to this? And I said, How, who, nobody has this in their malpractice. I mean, I, I, nobody has authored these things in their malpractice clauses because it is just, it's too new and it's too bizarre to have to spell out exactly this like very finite set of cases. Yet that's, it's fat. What's interesting to me is that this is not just court ruling having an effect this is now in, like in states, this is what I don't think the public understands. In states like Maryland, where I practice, DC, Virginia, states that have not banned anything are now having this open interpretation. And it is creating a federal, an unintentional federal kind of ban because of that. And I, I, think, I, I don't think the public's aware of it. And I don't think it's, uh, so maybe we can get into that in a, a future episode because it also leaks into education as well. Um, we're not teaching doctors how to do any of this, not just in the trigger states or in the banned states, but there's a pressure to 
opt out of these educational services in other states as well. Thanks for joining us. It would be incredibly helpful as we relaunch the show if you would rate, review, and subscribe to this feed on your favorite podcast player. We also hope you share this episode with your friends on social media. If you liked this episode and want even more of our conversation, become a member of the DSR Network and get a bonus segment where we're talking about disinformation, Elon Musk, and Twitter, all words we can relate to. Words Matter is a production of the DSR Network. The executive producer of the DSR Network is the excellent Chris Cotnor, and the producer of Words Matter is my favorite, Grant Haver. The next episode of Words Matter will be in your podcast feeds on July 15th. See you then. All right, welcome back for our members only. We're going to do a kind of a run through of some of our favorites around the First Amendment in particular. In particular, a tweet, I'll just read it. Uh, we'll have the link in the webisode. Alex Berenson, known for being literally the king of disinformation, who was banned from Twitter uh, in August, actually set up a tweet, uh, literally reading it out loud. Shady's back, tell a friend. Those of you who don't know what that reference is, go look at your favorite Eminem Spotify collection. For the full story of my reinstatement, including Twitter's acknowledgement of error, see my sub stack. And I'll spare the listeners for uh, Words Matter from having to click on the Substack and just tell you that basically, in after so many people, including myself, had actually reported Alex Berenson for a series of misinformation, actually were able to successfully get his account and Twitter suspended in August of 2021. And just to read like some highlights of some special Alex Berenson clips. One that the vaccines caused the, the vaccines caused genetic changes. Number two that the COVID vaccines actually keep you from getting immunity and actually promote reinfection. Number three, that if that vaccinated individuals in, this, in the country, in the UK and in European countries were actually dying at twice the rate of unvaccinated people. I can just go on and on and on and on about how everything that this man wrote was a series of lies and misinformation. So There was a very clear individual, myself, people that I didn't even know were constantly reporting Alex to Twitter. And Twitter doesn't take people off lightly, even though that's what the public might think. What's fascinating, though, is that in Alex's tweet, he immediately provoked a response from Elon Musk. And Elon Musk basically referenced, and it's clear that Elon actually went into the Substack. And Elon asks, like, tell me more about this government interference in public speech. And so I think that there's a very, not only is it obvious that Elon Musk has a very particular bent on trying to understand the role that government might have had in censorship and by the government, the Biden administration, because of the timing, August 2021, but that number two, that this is going to be a very clear like direction and signal. It's not just it's not just Alex Berenson who is likely to get given back Twitter privileges, everyone from Donald Trump to any of the others that were incredibly destructive will likely be seen back on Twitter. And the question remains, it's so easy for Alex to scapegoat and say, you know, I I was victorious, I was right from reading kind of the back scenes of what had happened. It did seem like there were an incredible army of lawyers. I'd be curious. I don't think Alex funded that. I'd be fascinated to know whether the Koch brothers or what team of conservatives actually backed a large team of lawyers to help with uh, fighting Twitter. But it was also interesting that in his thanks and his Substack, he also thanked Substack. And and it promotes what I have been fearing, that even if you play whack-a-mole and get someone off of Twitter they find other medium. And then those medium become amplifications. And now in this case, evidence to support that their voice was being suppressed, because how could it not be freedom of speech when he has public, I have public access to his written newsletter, but Twitter has limited his character use and has taken him off of Twitter. So it for for listeners and readers, it's at least just another reminder. And Norm, I think, whether it's Alex Berenson, this king of misinformation, or Elon Musk, who now clearly is going to go behind the scenes and put people back on Twitter, including possibly Donald Trump. We face, I think, we, we think we've seen misinformation. Just wait. I think all social media, not just Twitter, Substack, I do not think we have any federal policies. I do not think we have any entities, public or private, that can actually kind of squash these elements 
And I think we will only see a proliferation. And my only question is the proliferation is tilted for the disinformation, the purposefully kind of falsely manipulator, the manipulation for the falsehoods. And there are not the same and equal weight of people like you or like myself trying to just bring the evidence forward. This is, uh, I think, a real danger in a whole host of ways. You've mentioned one, which is public health. We're getting this anti-vax movement that's expanding. We're going to have, and of course, it goes far beyond COVID. It goes to all kinds of childhood vaccinations. We're going to have more and more people. We're going to see, I think, an upsurge in terrible, deadly diseases as a consequence. But it's also playing into the hands of white supremacists who want a civil war, who want to promote the most violent and vicious untruths and get a group of people who come to believe them that will trigger really bad things happening. You know, it's never easy to create a balance of what you limit in terms of speech, but we're moving in exactly the wrong direction. And the only good news here, I think, is that it's very unlikely that Elon Musk will be able to follow through and purchase Twitter, but he's clearly having a big impact now. And it's an intimidation that's going to have not just Twitter, but many of these other forces bending over backwards to allow disinformation. And that includes not just Substack, TikTok, a whole lot of other places that people are glomming onto. Facebook has been one of the biggest miscreants in this area in the past. And I'm not underplaying the difficulty of policing misinformation and disinformation, but we're heading into a dark space. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of uh, comfort in what we're seeing from players like Elon Musk. And I want to I want to conclude by just putting into listeners' heads something that Twitter has cited, Facebook and others have cited in allowing for individuals such as myself to report Alex Berenson and others like him. By the way, people use that same thing to report my information as falsehoods, but it's something called Section 230 of the U.S. Statutory Code, which is the Protection for Private Blocking and Screening of Offensive Material. So this really is just the, the kind of summary that, again, I would give myself and my children, is that it's what allows for kind of what's called Good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. And, uh, you know, I like to use the porn doctrine. It's like pornography. You know it when you see it. It is incredibly confusing when it comes to information around reproductive health, around public health. And so it's, it's something that Twitter cited, not just with Alex, but they've used it as the basis for why they removed people. That includes Donald Trump, by the way. However, this is now being turned on its head. And Alex Berenson, specifically his counsel, were able to counter an offer that Twitter was inappropriately over-relying on Section 230. So perhaps we can get into some of this into future episodes, because again, I think as you point out, Norm, this is um, unfortunately going to be just a sign of things to come. And it's why I will conclude with the policy mind that you and I, that we share we need to have, I, I'm not a big government kind of has to regulate these things, but it is time that we have infrastructure in place such that we have a way, even in these niche areas, whether it's science and health or children, even just children, I think that there has to be something done. And, and we're now so behind the curve. France and other countries offer such structure in terms of laws, and we have yet to, to heed the warnings, but I hope, uh, I hope some of these prominent people being reinstated on Twitter actually give us a little bit of a nudge. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening. And once again, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Take care.